you, you don't know love until you have kids. I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I respect people that decide not to have kids, but man, um, it just, you know, you think you love your spouse and then you have kids and you, you see those little eyes look at you and just, you know, there, there's just, it, it's, it's, it's spiritual. It's, it's, you know, emotional, it's everything all in one. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and I think one of the things I've enjoyed most about being a parent is just watching them grow and develop personalities and, you know, and, and see the traits, like what, you know, what, what traits do they have that they get from dad? What traits do they have that they get from mom or what mm-hmm. do they share? And, and uh, so, yeah, they're everything. And, and like I said uh, earlier, I think, you know, one of the things that um, I'll forever owe gratitude to my wife for is just forcing me to be there and, and watch them and be home every night with them and yeah. tuck them in and, and be with them. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Biz Dad Podcast. Today, I'm really excited to talk to Steve. He's got a lot of stuff going on. I'm looking forward to uh, introducing him to uh, to you all, talking to him about his businesses, his family, kind of introducing uh, um, his way of viewing things through there. Um, lots of talk about his two sons. I cannot wait for this conversation. So, Steve, why don't you open us up with an introduction about who you are, tell us about your family and your business. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Excited to be here. This is uh, my first formal podcast. Uh, I did some way back when, uh, so I haven't been doing this since probably 2016. So I'm excited to uh, relaunch my debut into podcasting, Um, but now as a guest, not as a host. So it's pretty cool. Um, Love it. So yeah, my name is Steve Lindlinger. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, Um, born and raised on a farm. Uh, Great family. We get into that. I have two uh, young boys. Colin is my youngest. Uh, he's 11. My oldest is Carter. He's 14. And then uh, my wife uh, of 16 years, Laura and I, we've been uh, married since 2009 um, and always try to, you know, focus on family first. So that's why I'm excited to get into this podcast. Uh, and then on the business side, um, mostly uh, my career has consisted of the construction industry. So I've spent a lot of time uh, as a project manager in the construction industry, and that's my current main business. Uh, so my old uh, my old boss uh, started a company in 2019 and asked me to join him. So I kind of came on as uh, not really the founder, but um, came on as as partner, if you will, of of uh, helping him grow and lead the um, the company. So Redwood Construction, we're a boutique firm, uh, do commercial and high end real estate uh, uh, residential projects here in Chicago land market. And then uh, we've recently also gotten into real estate. So we have um, tower real estate development. Uh, part of our uh, kind of plan when we got together for starting Redwood was to get more real estate under our belts. We've done a lot of development for other real estate owners and you know it probably looks easier than it is. So we thought we'd jump right into it. Um, so we'll get into that if you want on, uh, on our first foray of uh, you know, doing a development and raising money and all that good stuff. And then that sort of launched into um, another company that um, I'm working on outlining a startup uh, for this year that'll be in the industrial uh, small bay flex warehouse type space. So yeah, it's uh, got plenty going on to keep us busy. A ton of uh, activities with the kids I'm sure we'll get into, but that's uh, in general who I am. That's awesome. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to uh, go into a little bit of that. Um, I do have one completely off the wall question. You just said it though, and it reminded me of I've always wanted to ask this: What the heck does Chicago land mean? I mean, I get it, like the area, but everybody, nobody <laughs> says just Chicago or Chicago in the suburbs. For some reason, all of you folks that live in Chicago are like, ah, yeah, Chicago land. And I'm just, I'm always curious, where did that come from? I, you know, I'm sure there's some like cute story behind it, other than you know, it's one of those things everybody just says, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I grew up downstate Illinois. So like Chicago to me was like, like foreign, like a big town to me yeah. when I grew up was like 30,000 people. And now my little mm-hmm. suburb is like 40. So, um, <laughs> but I always called it Chicago land when I grew up too. So I think maybe it's just a Midwest thing, but, uh, maybe. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know. I never say this. I always say Chicago. Land, I don't say Chicago area. I don't even say like we're technically in Willowbrook, Illinois. I mean, nobody would know where that's at in no. business. So. Um, so we always say so Chicago, Chicago. Land, or we'll, see, we'll say West, you know, West Chicago, West, West suburbs mm-hmm. of Chicago, something like that. So yeah, it's a good right. question. I don't know. I'll have to research well, that and go over to you. 
Thanks, thanks for failing me on the first question I asked already. Great. That's, that's what I'm here for. I'm the <laughs> Way to start the podcast off strong. I look forward to this. Should be wonderful. Yeah. No. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Anyways. <laughs> but all right. So uh, I, I want to kind of get into a little bit of the history of you and, and where, where you're from, right? You said you grew up on a farm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like uh, your dad, maybe even your dad's dad, a little bit about how they grew up and what it was like growing up with your dad? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I have any uh, type of work ethic, it came from my parents for sure. Um, so my dad, uh, he was amazing. Uh, he uh, was served in the military um, and uh, came out of that, worked for Firestone uh, for quite a while, uh, changing tires and, and as a service station. And then um, he had the opportunity to move to where my mom was from on a farm and a little county called brown county in a town called mount sterling great deer hunting if anybody ever was interested got a lot of great land so <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> he uh so my dad moved there uh with my mom um they lived in jacksonville for a while and then started their family um and man they that if there's one thing they did right they knew how to grow a family so i have four older brothers and two older sisters nice. uh, they range in age of 20 years older than me to about 10 years older than me more or less so um, it was amazing. I, I grew up with, I'll tell people like, I, I feel like I had, you know, five dads and three moms sometimes because they were all so much older than me, but it was a good mm -hmm. upbringing. You know, I, I was taught baseball by my older brothers, you know, out in the pasture, um, hitting, hitting balls and trying to catch them. And, um, yeah. And so anyways, my dad was, it was amazing. He was a farmer. Um, at one point while I was young, he also became, um, a night watchman at the, the local union laborers camp. They had like a training facility. It was a, maybe a mile to two from my house. And he used to, to mow their yard. And one day the guy that, that ran the place came out to him and said, Hey, I, I need a night watchman if you know of anybody. And turned out that he ended up hiring my dad. So, you know, my dad's schedules were insane. He would, he would work and he'd wake up um, probably like 10, 11, cook breakfast if I was home or cook lunch or breakfast if I was home for the summer then he'd go out on the farm for the rest of the day and he'd come home maybe six, seven o'clock at night, eat dinner, shower up. He'd sleep for an hour or two, whatever he could get in. And then he'd wake up maybe nine or 10 o'clock and he'd go be a night watchman from, mm. you know, 10 or 11 until the next morning. And he'd come home at, you know, whatever it was, 6 a.m., make sure my butt was up and getting on the school bus and, and, uh, you know, it was during school and then that was it. So he was, uh, you know, hardest working guy I ever knew, uh, as I think a lot of farmers are, it's underappreciated yeah. trade, but, um, so yeah, he, he was, he was great. You know, he was there as much as he could be. Uh, we grew up in a pretty strong Catholic, uh, family. So, you know, Sunday church was always something that we did together and, and we always were doing church events and things like that. I went to, um, I was blessed enough to have a, a Catholic grade school, that I went to, we didn't have a lot of means to afford private school, but I, I was lucky enough that I had a, an older aunt that uh, helped a lot of my siblings and I uh, get into the, the grade school there. And we had a fairly decent uh, private school, that, uh, public school that we went to for high school and you know, small town. It's, it's funny. I laugh at it now. It's like my, my kids' kindergarten class is like the size of my entire high school. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was good. It was great upbringing. Like I said, my dad was a great role model, especially regards to work ethic and, and, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a lot, right. You know, we didn't, uh, have all mm -hmm. the shiny, shiny, flashy stuff, but you know, my mom and dad always found a way to make sure Christmas and birthdays were always a lot of fun. And, you know, I never, I think at some point as I was growing up, maybe when I was reaching my teens, you kind of start to figure out where you are on the uh, social ladder, if you will. Right. Yeah. You see friends that got boats and boat houses and, I was lucky enough to have two friends that had boats. So I, I got to do plenty of that on Illinois river and, and Lake of the Ozarks and things like that. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun growing up, but, uh, you know, we never had the means for that. Um, but you know, again, we always, you know, we always had food on the table and, um, you know, my mom and dad, they, they worked hard. We had a garden. So I grew up, you know, digging, planting potatoes and hilling potatoes and, uh, you know, sweet corn, shucking corn, all that stuff and ton of great little, little memories. And, uh, it's, it's interesting cause I'm, I'm pretty far removed from that now in my comfort little, yeah. comfortable little suburban home. But, uh, and I married a city slicker, if you will, she's amazing, but <laughs> there's no way I could get her to move out to a farm, uh, these days. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, it was, it was great, great, great way to be, uh, born and raised. 
Awesome. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah. That's a, um, it's, it's honestly almost refreshing to hear those types of stories compared to a lot of the, the heartbreaking stories that we tend to hear of, of childhoods growing up. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, always great to hear those types of things, but I'm curious, like, let's kind of walk through, um, you know, you had a father with multiple jobs, farming and that type of stuff. And then you end up, you know, running businesses. Um, so kind of walk me through a little bit of like what it was like for you going through high school, kind of what were your interests as you were growing up uh, that led you down a path to go into what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, I guess we, this is a long podcast, so I'll go into a lot of detail. So, you know, I went to, uh, when I grew up, I was always on the farm. So I was always building dams in the creek and, and I liked to, you know, go out and tear apart, you know, the old hog sheds and rebuild them. And then I was, uh, I, I really liked drawing when I was a kid, but I wasn't really good at like portrait drawing. So I applied those skills to like designing stuff. So I'd draw little, you know, concepts of cars and, and then I'd draw floor plans for homes. You know, like I, my mom bought me some graph paper and I'd like one foot each was one little square and I'd figure out how to do that. So I've always kind of had the acronym for that. And then, uh, you know, I had uh, Legos were like, if there was any, like, uh, I guess I'm lucky I didn't have phones and a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, gaming devices when I was a kid, but I was obsessed with Legos. I would, you know, I would build, you know, my mom would always laugh. She's like, I would get the box. I'd open it up. I would build whatever the instructions were in like 10 seconds. I'd play with it until it fell apart or broke. And then I'd completely tear it apart. And I'd like, Oh, they, they didn't, they didn't build this right. It's not strong enough mm -hmm. here. And I'd like rebuild it to like make it stronger or I'd, you know, I'd go to like the, we had a Brown County fair was a big fair. Uh, and they'd have the super modified tractor pulls come in. Um, and so they got the big wheels with the big long wheel bases. And so I, I tore apart like a spaceship set with the big wheels and then designed my own, you know, drag, drags, you know, like look, drag nice. star, uh, extra style, like, uh, tractors. So yeah, I was always doing little tinkering stuff like that. So I was, naturally inclined like when i when i went through school i had I actually a little bit of time i spent thinking about joining the seminary like i was pretty devout when i was a kid and mm -hmm. i had an older brother who was a great role model in regards to his faith um he had studied to be, actually he actually studied to be a deacon for a while in, in his older age and i think at one point maybe he thought about the seminary too so i, I kind of picked and choose like different components of of my brothers like what what you know personality traits that i became and uh, for my oldest brother, that was one of the traits I got was a strong faith. So, um, but I, at one point decided, I think I like girls better than, than most. So I decided <laughs> not to do the seminary route. And, um, so I, I looked at a couple of different things. I actually talked to a Navy recruiter for quite a while about, um, you know, joining their, um, program to do like nuclear subs and, but I'm mm -hmm. a little bit claustrophobic. So I decided against that. And then, um, I applied to university of Illinois. They got a good, uh, school of engineering and architecture. And, um, you know, I don't know if I wrote a great essay or what I, I had pretty good grades in my small town, but you know, SAT scores and all that stuff wasn't, I wasn't stellar by any means, but luckily mm -hmm. I got into their school of engineering. And so I, I went to U of I kind of with the idea of being an architect and civil engineer. And, um, I don't think I had much of an entrepreneur. Like I didn't think about being an entrepreneur enough, yeah. uh, much until I got to college um, and then sort of after college, I really got exposed to it. So I had a fraternity brother that was, you know, he was building, um, you know, bunk beds for other people's dorms and things like that. And I, you know, a smarter man would have latched onto that and learned from somebody like that and, and, and dove into that type of business. But I was too busy, you know, drinking beer and having a good time. And I got mm -hmm. into athletics when I was, I was there. I had, a I actually was a cheerleader for four years at University of Illinois, which was a lot of fun. So I got to go to all the football games and basketball mm -hmm. games and all that stuff. So that ate up a lot of my time and in, in, in between trying to pass engineering courses. <laughs> um, so yeah, I actually met my wife there too. She was a civil engineer um, uh, studying as well. So that's where we met. We um, then you know got out of college and I had a pretty good opportunity to go work for a large construction company here in Chicago. Uh, so I went there and started working. Um, you know, on a big replacement hospital in DeKalb, Illinois. It was a great project. I had two amazing mentors um, in the industry. Uh, they were just, I'll, I'll never forget, Sean was the project manager. He was amazing. He taught me everything I could possibly want to know about being a good project manager and running a good project. And then the superintendent was, um, 
you know, old school uh, superintendent, um, pretty, pretty strict with everything, but he knew how to have a good time. So I was in the trailer every day with those guys and it just, that was a blast. I loved it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the right choice for me. I still could tell you today things about that building and where, where certain things are. And I, I can close my eyes and visualize the building. Like I, it was a really cool project to be a part of. So, um, that was great. Um, so while I was there, um, I think that's when I kind of got the spark of being an entrepreneur. I, I don't know where okay. it came from necessarily. Right. I, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know if it was just the idea of, of employing people or being the boss or what it was, but so I helped, uh, I helped the guy start a drywall company, um, and w had thought about doing that on the side and going with him. And, um, that actually got me in trouble at that current company that I worked with mm -hmm. and they, they confronted me and they were worried about me doing stuff on the side. And so I, I actually ended up losing my job because I had helped somebody start a business on the side. Wow. They didn't like that. So, um, so two things, one is that taught me. I would never want to do that to somebody. If, if somebody that works for me has that entrepreneurial spirit, I want to latch onto them as much as I can and extract that value and support them because that, that mm -hmm. definitely was a tough go when that happened to me. Um, but you know, all things happen for a reason. And, and I moved on and found, um, another position, and, uh, at a different company and, you know, it opened up new doors for me. And, um, that company was great, great people, um, except for the leader of the company got himself in, in legal trouble on a project, a couple of projects and ended up the company shut down. And so that taught me really, you know, the importance of being ethical and, and not yeah. you know, trying to steal from people and being fair to people. And um, I ended up having to go through a bunch of background checks uh, to, to go work for the hospital that I worked for after that. Um, I took over managing the construction project that I was running for them before as that company. So got a whole bunch of experience with that. Actually, that was the first chance I had. Um, we almost started the construction company out of that. Um, me and a couple of the guys that uh, had all worked at that company uh, had the opportunity to try to go start and take over a couple of the projects. And unfortunately, it didn't work out at the time. Um, and uh, we moved on and I worked at the other company for about five years. And then um, that was about when, so that's probably around 2000. 9 2010 um mm -hmm. the the construction company or the hospital i was working at it sorry finished up all their work and um i wasn't sure what i was going to do after i thought about going and starting my own construction business um it was 2010 i actually when i decided when i was joining GoBundance, we were talking about real estate i actually went back and found emails that i had with some of my best friends from college we were going to go start a real estate company in 2010 <laughs> so talk yeah. about regrets honestly <laughs> Yeah, I was just gonna say that would have been a great time to do that. Oh. Yeah, Ali. Oh, I, I met with a guy who a really super nice individual um, from my hometown area who had done really well for himself in the stock market, and uh, I reached out to him and I, I kind of pestered him about being an investor to help us go buy real estate. And he's like, "Ah, you know, I only know stocks, and I lost a bunch of money recently, and I think real estate's bad." And and I just I let one guy's opinion, you know, one mm -hmm. no was enough, and and I just didn't do it. And then, uh, and then the construction company ended their stuff. And so then, um, I met my current, uh, partner and at the time he was starting a new division at a construction company. So it was a little bit of a, it felt entrepreneurial because it was originally sort of a business within a business. Right. And mm -hmm. fortunately that didn't work out long-term. They just kind of rolled it up as a division of the business and, and never gave us the opportunity to, to, um, to really start our own company within that. Um, but it was a great experience. It was, you know, my partner, Pat was the best boss I'd ever had. And, and we treated it like our own business. Like we were hiring and interviewing people and, and growing our company. And, you know, it was great because we had the back end accounting and all that stuff of a large company. Um, but we were able to grow that from, you know, I think the first year we did maybe a million or two in construction. And by the time we were done, we were doing, you know, I don't know, something like hundred million dollars a year. So, Oof you know, the yeah. company itself grew from like 300 million a year to almost a billion a year. And we left. So we had some, you know, I think we were a part of that in helping that company grow. Not, mm -hmm. you know, not all of it, but it, it was good. Um, with that though, we saw a lot of kind of the corporate world and, and, um, you know, kind of saw the, you know, the founder of that company leave the namesake leave and management take over. And we didn't all necessarily see eye to eye with how they want to do things. So, that's what led to Redwood starting. Um, so my boss, uh, at the time he left when they sort of 
started to shut down the healthcare group. And then uh, he started Redwood and the office was five minutes from where my kids play uh, hockey. So he told me, he's like, yeah, come by the nice. office someday. And so we had a meeting and he's like, yeah, if you ever want to leave, uh, if you ever want to leave, you know, clue the company I was at, he's like, if you ever want to leave, I'm, I'm here. And two months later, I'm, I'm sitting in his, in his office going, Hey, let's do this. So, uh, you know, that all worked out, but in the interim of that, um, probably my first real entrepreneurial effort was, uh, I had a couple buddies from college. Um, so right around the time that I got the job, uh, around 2010, uh, they had started a company in 2009 called Payline Data, and uh, completely unrelated to what my education or career was, uh, they did credit card processing sales. So okay. they started off as typical merchant services. You hire independent agents, go door to door, you know, those little credit card machines that you swipe your card at at mm -hmm. any boutique stores. Somebody behind that services that. And, and they're basically like an independent agent that represents a company that does the processing agreements on the back end. So that's what we were when, when I joined. Um, and then, you know, I had some dabbled in some internet uh, stuff and a little bit of, you know, light coding. Like I'm not at all a software guy, but I understand it enough to know what you can do. So I took that company and said, hey, let's go online. Uh, let's, you know, try to, to diversify. So eventually worked myself to a, a leadership position um, and, and a part owner of that company uh, and led the, the charge in trying to grow online. Uh, I had one of the best business partners I could ever ask for in that. I mean, he's still probably the best negotiator I've ever met in my nice. entire life. Um, so that helped us get really good deals that most of our competitors were not able to negotiate. Um, and then I had a, one of my uh, wife's cousins came and worked with us and he was kind of a, a great uh, asset and, and understood the product side of things and technology. So we all sort of worked together and, and grew that company. And, and I was able to do that. Um, you know, my current partner and boss at the time, I was pretty open with him that I was working on that when I came and joined um, joined him at the previous construction company. So I was able to balance doing a replay of the last one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was doing, doing, doing both. And, um, so that, that was good. He was supportive of, it. I think some of the leadership didn't like it, you know, but, um, yeah. again, I, I went in, I had started working with Payline before I joined Clune at the time. So there was no, there was no, it's answer buts. It was on my LinkedIn and everything. I, yeah. I don't think the upper management ever liked it. My boss never really cared because, you know, he'd get my emails at two o'clock in the morning knowing I was getting my stuff done. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that was the really, like, that's where I kind of cut my teeth as an entrepreneur. So, you know, really focusing on culture, uh, building a culture first, the whole start with why and, and, you know, get people motivated. Um, we had a really cool program where we gave back 10% of all of our profits of that business. Um, so that attracted a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. Attracted some customers, um, but it attracted more just quality, talented individuals, and, and people yep. would want to work for the reason that you know the impact we were making. So it was great. Um, and then around like 2015, 16, we started to raise money to grow the business. Um, it was getting to the point where I was soon going to have to make the decision of okay, do I go full time with Payline and leave the construction career, or you know what's what's the path? And as we were raising money. We raised a little bit of private debt and then we were looking to raise a bigger round. And uh, we had an experienced entrepreneur who had sold his previous business backed by private equity in the same industry. So he was getting ready to do it again. And, and he came in as an investor and ended up at some point just deciding he was going to buy the company. So mm -hmm. he bought uh, Payline Suite. I think we sold in 2017, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and that was interesting, you know, just going through that whole you know, deciding how to sell and doing the valuation yeah. and, and, um, you know, really all the underwriting that went with that. So again, you know, just a unique experience in going through that process. And, um, you know, it was, it was actually a little bit of a relief for me because, you know, up to that point I had young kids, they weren't fully in hockey yet, but I was spending, you know, I, I was probably working 60, 80 hours a week minimum, you know, between the two businesses mm -hmm. to manage everything. And, um, my wife was supportive, but, not appreciative of the amount of time I yeah. put in the businesses. Right. So it was definitely a, a, a point of, you know, friction in a relationship of that work life balance. And, you know, I, I think sometimes because my dad worked so hard and that was his work ethic that maybe that 
in some way rubbed off on me and how I, and how I work. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I do think there was some correlation there to, to, you know, my workaholism sometime. And, and I, I try to really be conscious of it. And if there's one thing my wife has been unbelievable at is just reinforcing family first, you know, be here for yeah. me, be here for the family, be here for the kids. You know, we travel a lot together, all that stuff. And, but that's always been her, you know, she, she's always said, it doesn't matter how much money we have. If you're not home, yep. it, it doesn't mean anything. So, so yep. that, that's, she's really, uh, a, a little bit of the yin to my yang, if you will, of, of, you know, keeping me grounded in that. And I probably never do enough to make her happy in sense of being around, but, um, you know, I, I think I try my best and, and we try to balance it, but that was, you know, really rewarding when, when Payline sold, um, you know, yeah. it wasn't, uh, it wasn't money that, you know, transformed and, and I could, it wasn't, you know, F you money, if you will. Right. It wasn't yeah. uh, complete freedom, but it was enough to, to sock it away. And then we could actually realistically look and go, oh, hey, hey, we could retire early and, you know, live off of this minimal income like that. Yeah. That's a real possibility now. Um, so that was a really um, gratifying experience. And so after that, I, I really struggled with, you know, what was going to happen with the construction company. Do I, you know, stay there? Do I think about starting other startups? Um, do I, you know, maybe leave construction still and go the startup route? Or do I just devote all the construction and leave that behind? And, and it took a, about a year of just kind of back and forth on what I wanted to do. And um, life has a funny way of working itself out. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, over those couple of years, that's when the opportunity, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that they weren't going to move forward with the healthcare division at, at, um, the current company and, and, you know, with the leadership change. So we had already kind of, you know, my partner and I'd say, Hey, if, if we decide to leave, let's go do our own thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a surprise when, when I joined them. Um, mm -hmm. so they, for, they forced that a little bit on us, but, uh, in the interim, I, the funny part was about private equity is the good and bad of private equity is, you know, they can pay a lot of money for your business. The bad part is they don't care about the culture and the employees and everything yeah. else. And, um, the one downside, the one, if I had any regrets of watching that was watching them dismantle, you know, what was, you know, almost 50 employees in Chicago. And one of the pictures, actually, that was the office that we built out. I, so my construction mm -hmm. company got the build out the office for my side business, which was really cool nice. and fun to do. And, um, but you know, watching that office close and go to sublease and, and everybody get moved around or let go from the company. That was, um, that was the one thing that I, I, I struggled with, uh, probably the most in that acquisition, but we did have an opportunity out of that. Um, the private equities, they're not good at dealing with, um, understanding the overall business that they buy, right. They understand mm -hmm. the numbers, but, we had a ton of leads coming in still online through all the SEO work and stuff that we had done. And they realized quite pretty quickly. They were, they were not equipped. Like they were a, a, a buy and build type acquisition company, mm -hmm. right? They just kept acquiring more accounts. And so they came back to us and our partners and actually offered to license the, the website and the name back to us. If we would invest in the personnel, the people to start up the business again. So we actually had an opportunity to do that within about a year of, of it mm -hmm. of us selling. We relicensed and all invested as equal partners again to start up this new company, um, and that was great. That was a nice uh, horizontal income passive investment for yeah. me over the last four or five years. And we did end up finally um, we had a good opportunity to exit that, so we exited that last year. So that's finally, I think, done done now. Um, done and sold the company that we sold to. We had a little share and that finally sold too. So that, that all is finally closed, sealed and done behind us. But, um, nice. yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. So I, that's led me to kind of the current, uh, position I'm in. And, and now I'm looking at, okay, I have only vertical income. Now the horizontal incomes are all kind of done. So mm -hmm. where am I investing my time and efforts and, and money? And, um, and as I started to do that, I knew, you know, industrial real estate was always sort of attractive. Um, and we've done a lot of, you know, work for other owner operators that have bought buildings that we've renovated and, and it brought up to spec and, and improved. And uh, so we started having the concept that we could do that for other, 
you know, previous clients, if they wanted to expand, maybe we could be partners with them. And, and that's sort of evolved into this new business concept that I have where uh, I look back and said, okay, I have experience in branding. I have experience in online B2B business, B2C yeah. business. You know, I, I understand the operations of, you know, real estate. Um, the good part about leasing and industrial is it's, it's easier than leasing and multifamily. So you could potentially... Mm-hmm manage those properties a little easier yourself and so we're, we're working on a business plan for acquiring industrial assets um, and or developing and building them and some of it might be um, either adaptive reuse or or kind of you know looking at it from a standpoint of what can we do with the current business you know if we moved them out and maybe subdivided a large single tenant building into micro tenants um, so either, you know, doing like micro tenant, uh, leasing in the industrial space, uh, where you have like a shared loading dock for a larger building that then you mm-hmm. can share between a bunch of smaller tenants. And then also doing the small bay individual demised small bay flex as well, whether that's, you know, build this, kind of building the suit in a development site or taking like a, a strip building that's maybe rented now that's all individual tenants and individual and then kind of branding it under one building under this new uh, business entity and then subleasing each of those. So a little different model where you're not necessarily yeah. looking for individual triple net leases. You're doing like a, just a gross lease on all those. And then us as a business is signing a triple net lease with the owners of the building uh, directly, which hopefully we're on the owner side too. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind man, of a full man. circle of business. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we went we went around a, a couple blocks there, and I want to. There's a couple things I want to hit on. Um, is while you and I had very very different um, ways of getting into entrepreneurship, um, the, there seems to be a theme here. Is you bounced around to a couple different jobs. Uh, part. Of, excuse me. Bounced around to a couple different jobs and learned a lot from each one of those jobs that ended up yeah. getting you to the point where you are now that you're using every bit of those things that you learned to be able to build the businesses that you're building and be able to run the, the companies that you're running. So um, where me, I, I had, you know, a very odd, um, you know, going through the military side of the house, um, very odd to have somebody who'd had four different jobs in the military like I did. Um, you know, I had uh, two on the enlisted side and then um, and then jumped on the officer side and, and changed some things up over there too. So it's it's a lot it's very different, but I could never find what I really wanted to do. Like where I, I, I had the the control that I wanted, that I had the things that I was looking for. I kept always looking for something more. And it seemed you were kind of doing the same thing. And then when you weren't having it, you went to the outside and then you get, you know, you get fired because you went to the outside and did something. And then you were like, okay, well, I'm going to start something anyways, but I still want to go to this, this corporate job. So you go do the corporate job and you're like, man, I just, I'm not liking this, you know? So there was, there seems to always be, you know, in, in both of our lives, kind of a little bit of a taste of, um, we're just not quite satisfied with what we've got. Like, there's something more that I'm looking for, something I'm driving towards, and I don't know what it is. Um, and now it seems that you've kind of found your way. Like, you're operating a business, you're wanting to start more businesses. You're like, no, this, this is what I was missing. Like, I wasn't able to control the things that I wanted to build and the things I wanted to do. Um, and I want to kind of toss that over to you for a second and see if there, if that seems accurate to you, or if you think there's some other theme uh, at play there. No, um, man. Uh, y- you're, you're, you're a good host because you're nailing the, nailing on the head. Um, uh, I really just had this revelation recently. Um, you know, as, um, you know, any business, right. It, it could be taxing and there's issues and there's growing pains mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you, you, it's funny. Like it's like a real estate business or a construction business versus a software business. They're very, very different, but yet a lot of the things are kind of the same. And, um, what, I found is like the system side of things to grow. That's, that's our, like, that's my weak mm. point, right? That's the, like, I need the integrator. I need help with that. So we, we hired a business coach to help my partners and I in the construction side. Um, so we're working on implementing uh, a lot of their systems. And this year we'll be, you know, growing that um, we actually, you know, made a key hire recently to be kind of the office executive to help us kind of lay the groundwork of that, if you will, and build out what the the playbooks of our standard operating procedures are and, and mm-hmm. really grow that. Um, and as I'm going through that, I started recently like thinking about, man, why am I like, why is my mind going to starting this other business? Right? Like, why do I keep thinking about um, starting another business like that? that's insane. Like I should not be doing that with everything I have going on and the, and the challenges we currently have with, you know, the other business. So 
I, I really, I, I found that both challenging from a standpoint of like, should I be doing it? But I also found it challenging from the standpoint of like, if I don't do it, am I going to regret it? Because it kind of goes back to the real estate side. When I, you know, I look way back in 2010, like mm -hmm. if I had followed my instincts, I, you know, I'd be even better off financially. Now everything worked out. Like I think the, yep. the opportunity with Payline and the software kind of landed in my lap and, and I made the best of that, but you know, maybe I could have done both. But I don't think my wife would have liked that, but you know, like I look back on it and, and the timing was right. Right. If I, if I had done it. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the, the visionary side of me is what drives that. And, and you're probably similar. I think a lot of guys in GoBundance are actually, I yeah. found that a lot of, you know, visionary ask people. Um, so I'm, I'm wrestling with, does it make sense to think about trying to start something new and, you know, growing something new until I have the, the animal that is the construction business more squared away. Right. Yeah. And, it's a, it's a catch 22, right? So on one side, it's like, okay, yeah, I should just focus all my efforts on everything that needs to be fixed over here on the construction business and put these ideas on the, on the burner. Whereas the other side of me is like, well, if I fix everything on the construction business and then it's running, then, then what do I do? Then I got to start something from scratch versus, okay, if mm -hmm. I start planting the seeds now, you know, it's not going to take off. I'm not going to be in hiring employees anytime soon, but if I could get it to where by the end of the year, it's revenue generating and could justify investing in an employee to help run it, or it gets to the point where maybe we could raise money to grow the business. Um, then the construction company could keep going and I could then have the next stepping stone, you know, on to the next. And that, you know, fills my cup more as, as we really yeah. say, right? Like what fills your cup? Mm -hmm. I get excited about that. And, and I just, you know, I'm, um, you know, driving to a job site or wherever we're taking a trip and the kids are all asleep. And that's where my, my mind goes. Like I start thinking about you know, what, what's the brand name, what's the name of this business going to be? What is the, you know, where, what's the right, like, what's the logo going to look like? What's the, how do I market yeah. it? Like where, what, you know, like that's the stuff that I just I get jazzed up about. And, um, yeah. so I, I, I've sort of decided very recently, like, in fact, in the last, the last week that, that's, I need to figure out how do I harness that and, and then how do I hire the, the other components of what we're trying to do, right? So how can I yeah. hire more to help with the construction? And, you know, the hard part is going to be that the, that might take some sacrifice, you know, um, either, you know, deferring, uh, you know, taking a bonus here or there or deferring yep. a raise for myself and, you know, maybe staying under, under market for what I'm paying myself in the construction business so I can have the time to go over here. And, and that honestly is the hardest thing. Like for me personally, if it, if I didn't have a family, like I, that would be a no brainer decision, but yeah. having the responsibilities of a family and, um, you know, my, my wife does still work. She's blessed to work remote with the company she's at, but you know, I'd like to be able to get to a point where she doesn't have to work. Like if they, mm -hmm. she probably is there now, but if they came to her and, and eliminate her position or something, I, I don't, you know, I don't want her to have to go through finding a new job. And I, I want her yeah. to be able to focus on the family and, and enjoy the time. So, so it's a struggle because there's the financial aspect of, okay, if I do this, I'm either having to invest time. It's, it's an investment of money potentially, and more importantly, probably time. Yeah. Um, and how do I avoid taking away any time? Cause it my you know, my oldest is now a freshman in high school, the youngest in sixth grade. So I got, you know, essentially six years from now until when maybe they're both off, you're sending them off yeah. to college. Right. And that's where sometimes you're on a different page than your, than your significant other. Right. Like, yeah. And I, I always, I always wrestled with that. I, I always thought that was a bad thing. You know, if we maybe want different things, right? Um, and I and I try to convince myself, oh no, yeah, we want the same thing. We want, you know, mm -hmm. security and time with our family. And, and and at the end of the day, like we do, um, but I think we want different means to get there, right? And yeah. and that that's a that's a hard one, right? That's like that's what I get hung up on because I want to do all these things, but then it's like, okay, by doing that, am I taking away? time. So I, I just recently, 
started Dan Martell's book, um, Buy Back Your Time. And that's, uh, I'm in the middle of that one right now. And that's, that's been pretty eye opening. And I think what's exciting about it, and when I say it's eye opening, is it started to make me think about, okay, actually, I might be able to do this, but I don't mm-hmm. have to do everything, right? I just, mm-hmm. I might have to figure out this is the way we should do things, but then I can assemble a team that can go do those things for me. And, you know, his, the one thing he says multiple times in the book, he's like, 80% done or 80% good for somebody else doing it is a hundred percent excellent for you. Or I, I screwed up the way he termed it, but you know, if you're doing things a hundred percent, you're limited, right? You can only do certain yeah. things. Whereas if you can hire out people to do it 80% as well as you, you could, that's a hundred percent great for you. Cause you bought back a hundred percent of yeah. that time. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so that sort of changed the, the, the approach, it's starting to change how I'm thinking about doing some of these things. So instead of me thinking about how do I go start this business, I've started to think, okay, how do I lay the groundwork for this business? And then who, right, the who, not how concept, who could I bring in that could help me execute on that? And, um, you know, I've, I've already started networking pretty well with with some great GoBundance guys, um, even some guys locally. And, and you know, we've started talking about doing some of the the groundwork of finding the properties locally to, to pilot this yep. and start it. Yep. So, you know, I, I, maybe even before I started reading that book, I started to do that component of it. And now it's okay. Operationally, you know, who's the right person. Do I find, you know, maybe I find somebody and go on its emerge or somebody in my local network that is, is me from 10 years ago, right? They're, yeah. they're young. They maybe have just started a family, but you know, it's actually, I found it was a lot easier when the kids were little, um, to be a workaholic because, you know, you got babysitters or, or whatnot. We were lucky enough yeah. to have in-laws that, that took a, my in-laws took a lot of that. But But um, now, now that my kids are older and they're in, you know, travel high, I mean, it is, it's insane how much, Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's five nights a week, more, more or less like four or 5 PM. I, I got to be out of the office. I got to be going to pick them up and drive them here or drive them there. And, and, uh, you know, there's been periods of time, I mean, this last summer between a family vacation, we took an epic family vacation, which I can get into later, but between family vacation and two trips for, for travel hockey, I think I was in the office three days in six weeks hmm. over, over impressive. a pretty busy, pretty, over a pretty busy period of the summer. Yeah. Uh, it, it was impressive that my partners did so well, like <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they kept it together and, 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 uh, and did an amazing job of, of letting me get away. Cause part of it was a cruise where I'm just, you know, in a different country, like yeah. I couldn't connect if I wanted to. Right. And, um, yeah. So, so I think it, it was having the right people, the right partners. I know that put a lot of stress on him and, and I probably owe him for that. But, um, it was also just, you know what, you, you got to do it when you're young, right. You got to mm-hmm. do it when you can enjoy the time with the kids. So th- there's been times where the, that work life balance, um, is never in balance. I don't think it ever will be. I think anybody yeah. that achieves true work-life balance is that's a unicorn to me. Like I, yeah. I always feel like it, the pendulum swinging one way or the other, right? I'm either spending too much time at work because I'm trying to find new work or I'm trying to start this new business or I'm swinging this way where I'm spending a lot of time with family and things are not quite working the way I want on the business. So, mm-hmm. you know, where, kind of bring it full circle where I'm trying to get on the same page with, with my wife is like, okay, I know she thinks I want all this. I want to be all business all the time, you know, striving, whatever it may be. And it, it, a little bit of it's money, right? Like, I mean, anybody that says it's not is crazy in my opinion. Like yeah. it's always driven. Like it's, oh, it, and it's not because that's not the only reason I also really enjoy building the team and creating something. And, and that gives me that creative juices, right. Of like building something that, that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I know she wants me, you know, just right now, like just focus and be home every minute that you can be home. And I, I am, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit scared that I would be bored if I was doing that uh, or I'd feel like I'm missing out. So I, I think what I've started to determine in, in reading the books and, kind of thinking about the who, not how, or the buy back your time is, all right, I'm going to swing to starting to do business, but I'm going to find the right people to yeah. help me do it so that I can still balance towards spending that time with my kids, especially for those, these next six years, because 
you know, uh, it, I probably, I had kids pretty young and I wasn't quite an entrepreneur when I had the kids, right. When mm-hmm. we just kind of dove right into having kids. And I hear a lot of guys that I, you know, even on your podcast, I'm like, man, these guys are like so far ahead of where I was when I started having kids because they've already thought about some of these things and the work life balance and, yeah. and, um, and I, I don't remember the guest you had on. They were talking about the um, uh, the um, family board meeting, right? Yeah. And kind of organizing yourself. And I'm like, this, I almost feel like it's too late because, you know, I'm 14 year old and 11 year old. Like, I could probably still force nah, it. Never but, too late. Maybe not, but but it feels late. Um, whereas, yeah. you know, if you started that concept when the when the kids were younger, like it would have been definitely easier than than it is today. So I think that there's a few things I want to pull from from there. One of the things I was going to say is you have a lot of the answers to what you're talking about in the books behind you. Um, so I've read a majority <laughs> of those books, right? And, and like you said, you're not very good at systems. Um, you got traction there. So if you implement EOS, which I've got right there, if you're watching on video, my EOS yep. notebook, right? So with all of our, our meetings, all the stuff that we've done, uh, implementing EOS, which has done amazing for the company, right? And in making sure that we're highlighting what we actually should be doing. Um, so we just started doing that last year and it's been awesome. Like a huge um, shift in what we were doing last, um, the year before to what we're doing last year to now what 2024 is, is bringing. Um, and as we're recording this, it's brand new in the beginning of it's January 4th as we're recording. So um, really looking forward to where the rest of this year goes. Um, so if you're implementing the systems and you hire the right who's, then it makes your life a lot easier to be able to go chase a lot of those things down. So, you know, I, I, I don't remember who it was, but I was talking to somebody who was at a, a Nashville Go Abundance event and they were talking about how they had, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars they're going to be investing back into the business. Um, uh, but they were, you know, struggling with this time and that time. And, you know, I looked at them and said, why don't you, you know, invest a hundred thousand of those dollars into a really good COO that is going to run your company well? One year contract, COO, hundred thousand dollars into it. See if that takes a majority of the stuff off your plate so you could focus on the things that actually do fill your cup. Um, because if you put the right who in there, they're going to do a better job than you um, because they're able to focus fully on that job. Like you were talking about, you're buying back your time, right? So if you're focused on on this job, that job, and that job, and you feel like you're giving hundred percent to each of them, which is physically impossible. Well, if I hire the right who for that first portion of the job, well, now they're actually going to do 100% on that and they're going to crush it. And that helps take one of those things off my plate. Um, so as you're trying to figure out how to grow those those uh, uh, those extra businesses, yeah, you have to write the right systems in place and the right who's sitting in those spots. Um, I don't know. It sounds like in what you're talking about, you're getting close in in your businesses. I mean, you're able to take a six-week, borderline a six-week hiatus. Obviously, you were, you were still yeah. working from your phone, your computer and all that type of stuff, but uh, just not in the office yeah. where some things, the systems were obviously starting to work. And now it's just finding the right who's to really narrow that in so you could take a lot of that off your plate. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, so EOS, that's one where... I'm sorry, can you say that again? I just like hearing that. I don't hear that enough. Can you say that you're right part again? Just... <laughs> you're right. You're very right, yeah. <laughs> Man, I felt this, good. This funny side story to that. So my wife and I have this thing. It's I don't even know when this started, but we literally have this like little song and dance that we do when one or the other has to admit <laughs> that the other person is right. It's like, you guys are right, right, you're wrong. Like, you know, like making fun of each other. Like, so, yeah, so I'm Good. used to being I love wrong. That. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'll do a little dance for you next time. Um, All right, looking forward but, to it. Uh, yeah, so um, EOS is, it, I, I thought about this last year maybe even the year before. And I started looking at it and I struggled with how to apply EOS to a construction company because we have so many projects and I felt like each project needed its own level 10. So um, not to go too far in the weeds, I've, I've sort of now full circle revisited that um, I think we need to implement at least loosely the structure of it. Uh, one of my pods actually just um, just recently within the last few meetings of it uh, started launching EOS as our framework for the pod, which yep. has been a great introduction for me um, to learn it in, in a kind of a safe environment, right? Because you yep. can't lose money in, in that environment, right? And and the accountability, like the to-dos are really only your own. So it's been a great, mm-hmm. like anybody, I guess a great way to start with EOS is just find something like a mastermind or a group that you can accountability group, um, like we have in go abundance that you can use it with. But, um, so that's been good. So I'm, I'm, I've sort of tabled rereading, uh, traction. Um, I also, um, what's the, uh, the follow up to traction? Um, oh, shoot. Uh, 
Yeah, the, it's the um, yeah. the one that defines whether you're an integrator or um, a, uh, a visionary. Um, so I, I, I read that fuel? one a few. The rocket fuel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, I have that one. It's not on my shelf. I have that one at home. That's another that's one I'm going to get too. through. So, yeah, yeah. So we really, you know, like that's there, there's plenty of knowledge, right? Like that's sometimes the, mm-hmm. the danger of these books and, and the True. self-help world and even pod, right? Like you can consume a ton of good podcasts and I cannot tell you how much value I've gotten out of various people on podcasts, just mm-hmm. whether it's a book to read or a system to try or a tip of how to handle an employee or a tip of how to handle your kids. Like, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I don't have a lot of leisure. Like I'm not like out, like, you know, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not prone to, like, I love listening to music, but I'd rather listen to a good podcast. Right. Yeah, like, I feel like, so. Same here. You know, it's just, a. I, I enjoy that self, that quest for self learning. And, um, but you know, it all at the end of the day comes back to implementation. Right. So, yeah. um, one thing you mentioned, you're using the workbook. I, I think that's part of the key, right. It's really, so I, I have the traction workbook and the and the um, buy back your time workbooks both sitting here on my in my kind of take home to do stack of things to work my way through and, and work on. But um, it it comes back to that implementation. So I, I think we're you know we're starting down that right path. Uh, and you know, go I, I would there. recommend hiring an implementer because the implementation is very difficult. Implementers are expensive. But man, oh man, that is a who, not how. Like, don't try to figure out how to implement it yourself in the business. Just find the who that's going to implement it for you. Spend the money on it. Make it happen. Well worth it. They help you organize yeah. things properly mentally. They help you make sure that we're doing the right things. Separate yourselves from from what's actually going on. Um, just let the, they're, they're completely non-biased. Go in there and make sure that you're crushing it and, and implementing the thing the way you're supposed to. And it's it's been well worth the, the time and effort with, uh, with an implementer. That's good to hear. Yeah, I, I was a little scared about whether it would be val- you know, is there the value in it, right? Like, what are they doing yeah. other than you know rereading the book back to you and telling you what to do? Like, that's well, good thankfully, that's not see. quite right. But they're hosting great, great meetings, helping you kind of make sure you're staying on track, keeping you on tra- task inside of those annual meetings, teaching you how to use all of their tools, and like doing them one on one with you, and making sure that you're you know like really breaking down what your core values actually are for your company as everybody on the same page and the leadership teams and, and putting all of this into, into practice for you and put, building it all out. Um, not to mention I can get on a call with my implementer anytime I want and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this area or that area or what, like, am I doing something wrong over here? And, um, they're always, he's always helping us out in one way, shape or form. So, um, for anybody who's listening, who's looking at EOS, I do strongly recommend hiring an implementer. They're not cheap, but they're well worth their, their money. Right. Um, and really yeah. when you think about it, if it takes you, um, you know, two years to, you know, 70% implement it, or you can use this guy for, you know, a year, year and a half to 90, 95% implement it. Yeah. That, to me, that's what money well spent, right? You're saving a whole lot of money in yeah. the long run. So. Yeah, no, that's good but, advice. Yeah. So I, I think we'll probably look at that. Um, again, it's, it's just, making sure it fits our business model. Yeah. That, that was always my concern. So yeah. I think interview a couple through, implementers and they'll, they'll help you yeah. figure it out. Yeah. It'd be great. I mean, if there's any implementers out there that, uh, that have helped construction companies reach out, <laughs> I'll reach out to mine. I'll reach out to mine yeah. and ask. That would be huge, hugely helpful. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Um, you know, it's, it, it there's not a day that goes by like, that there's not always that, you know, creeping fear in the back of your head that all the, mm-hmm. the wheels are going to come off tomorrow. Or, you know, when you get the stresses and you're like, man, I should just hang it all up and go back and cuddle up in the corporate blanket for the rest of my life. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm, I'm smart enough to know if I did that, I, I'd be miserable. Right. But like yeah. that's, that's the problem. Like it would be, I'm sure it would make my wife happier right? Cause I'd have set hours and I'd be home more and I wouldn't be thinking about all those things. And I wouldn't be an asking her to invest our hard earned money into some crazy real estate deal that I want to do. Right. That, that, um, she may or may not understand enough to say yes to. And, but at the end of the day, if I was just sitting at home and watching stocks or whatever, you know, the 401k grow or not grow, like I just, I feel like I would feel a little dead inside. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I, I know I can't do that, you know? So I've, I'm going to ask a question that I've never asked just at this, this is 
interesting the way I'm trying to frame this in my brain. If you were to go back, so your dad worked a lot, was a hard worker on, on multiple different jobs and did different things. Um, and then you have the ability now to sit back and look at how he operated um, and then how you're operating and the, the freedoms that both sides provide and the handcuffs that both sides provide. Um, if you were to look like which one of those books in the background that you you have up there would have best benefited your dad or do you think your dad would have most like liked and enjoyed? Oh, man. That's a great question. You know, I think that's it's that's really hard. Um cuz I don't I don't know that my dad was a uh, avid reader, right? Um, well, that's not part of it. This is just this is but, all this is all no, conjecture, anyways, right? So yeah, yeah. So like, if I think like I can't even like think of books that he read. I mean, I can <laughs> tell you an interesting story is another like lesson learned for like kids. It's, it, I I buy Rich Dad Poor Dad for a bunch of you know I'll hand that mm-hmm. I got like four copies behind this copy. I'll hand it out to people. I'm like, start here. This will make you rethink things. Uh, my mom actually bought that book for me when I was probably either going into college or just out of college. And I think I read a little bit of it. I don't know though, if that didn't somehow, I I don't know that I credit the book to starting my entrepreneurial spirit, but it was right around that same time that I started thinking a little differently about life. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't know whether I discredit that. So I do think maybe, um, you know, going back to your question, um, you know the dad being a, a being a as hard of a worker as he would he was you know if 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 he could have pulled out you know something out of like the who not how concept and and the reason i say that is my dad my dad was the old school you you work hard you get rewarded the harder you mm-hmm. work the more you can earn type of person and, you know, if, if as hard as he worked, he was always somebody else's who, even, even when he kind of did his mm-hmm. own thing as a farmer, like it, it, you, you're kind of a cog in the wheel unless you can get to where you have employees working for you and, and you buy more land. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, that, that book, you know, that concept of, maybe having other people do some of the work for him so that he could have done other things that are more important um, would have been, would have been helpful. And, and probably especially to, um, so I, I never unfortunately really got to know my dad's dad or my, my I didn't know my grandparents very well. Uh, my grandma on my mom's side, I was closest with, she was kind of my caretaker growing up and, and I spent a lot of time growing up at her house Um which is, it's funny because now I, I think of like the cousins, my, my kid, my kid's cousins. So my wife's family comes over to my house mm-hmm. all the time now. Um, you know, anytime we have holidays, birthdays, you know, anytime we can, we travel with them all the time. I always look at that. I feel like that's a little bit of the way my grandma's house was growing up, like, except for without the really good home cooking, we just order out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but my, my grandpa on, so her husband, uh, so my grandpa on my mom's side, he was the original owner of, of Volk Farms. That was that was his name. And I think if there was anybody that from talking to you know to, to people who knew him pretty well, if there was anybody that probably could have been an entrepreneur and just didn't because he wasn't afforded the opportunities or culture culturally it wasn't it probably could have been him. You know, he was mm-hmm. I was told he would, you know, calculate, you know, like if they're, you know, talking about what the cost for, uh, you know, what you get paid for a, a bushel of, of, you know, corn, or if you're talking about how many, you know, bags of seed you need to plant a certain number of acres, he was the guy who could just do those numbers in his head. You know, he just was yeah. a smart guy and, and devoted and good family man. And um, so what, from what I understand of him, you know, he probably could have been the entrepreneur in the family. And, and I, I don't know if my dad ever got that, you know, I don't know if he ever got that, that opportunity. Um, but yeah, the work ethic side of it, it, yeah, it could have been, it could have been amazing if he, if he had been able to instill it. And, you know, I thought about that sometimes like at the, the family farm and, you know, if the boys, you know, some of us could have taken it over and, and, you know, grown it, what could it have been? Yeah. Probably, the, probably the timing of it wasn't right. Um, you know, it's just a, such a, uh, 
you know, lack of non glamour, right? The opposite of a glamorous job. Yeah. Right? It's just hard work uh, or a lot of hours. You know, you talk about guys that can't take vacations. Like I just, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, a couple of family trips. Like we didn't travel when I was young nearly as much as, as uh, what we do now, today's world. But, um, you yeah, know, I remember them just figuring out, okay, who's going to, Who's going to feed the cows? Who's going to take care of the mm -hmm. pigs? Who's going to, who's going to check on the dogs? You know, like just, just, it was hard to get away for more than a week or, you know, if you, if you tried to get away for two weeks, it was almost impossible. So, you know, that, that again, if, if it could have been that who not how, where they had people that worked for him, you know, even if it was just hired hands, that probably could have been something that would have, you know, if, if my dad could have had the farm, been able to check on an hour a day and still worked as a night watchman, right? Like, yeah. I, I honestly, I, I, he, he ended up passing a few years ago and, and unfortunately had, um, you know, a, a pretty good bout with, uh, with Alzheimer's and, and dementia towards the end of his, mm -hmm. his life. And, you know, I, I read, there's a really cool book, it's not on the bookshelves behind me, but it's, it's called why we sleep. Um, and I forget the author's name off the top of my head. Um, but, um, that was one of the more impactful, impactful books for me. Cause I, I was, I was, I, you know, I'd run on like four or five hours of sleep a night and, and just work, work, work. And, you know, until I kind of crashed and, and that book mm -hmm. changed my mind a little bit because it talked about the real importance of getting a consistent six or seven hours of consistent sleep and what it does to your performance. If you're only, you know, if you get zero hours of sleep, you know, your performance is just like you were intoxicated. If you only get four hours of sleep, if you do that over time, it actually ends up that tiredness. You have the same lack of reaction and thought process as you do as if you were partially intoxicated. And, um, and another part of the book talks about the potential of like, we, we don't quite understand why we sleep, right? Like not fully. And the chemical processes that happen while you're asleep can actually, you know, rinse your brain of those proteins in a yeah. way. And um, there's a theory that that's part of what can lead to, to Alzheimer's. So I've definitely changed my, as much as I can, I, I still have bad nights, but as much as I can change how much I sleep. And so going back to what my dad was, I, I do think that was maybe a contrib you know, contributor to, to some of his, at least maybe he would have gotten it anyways, but maybe accelerated it for him yeah. because he never, he never really slept more than three, four hours. And, um, you know, and, and he did it. It just, it, that's just the life that he did. And he did it because that was hard work. And that's what he did to support his family. And, and mm -hmm. that time that he put in, you know, working those nights has, has been, you know, a transformational, uh, for my mom with, because it was uh, a union labor camp. They, they ended up, uh, enrolling him and getting some benefits. And that's been, you know, huge to my mom and her retirement to get some of those benefits nice. on the backside. So, yeah. um, yeah. Anyways, uh, to answer your question a very long way. <laughs> no, that's happen? good. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, you know, my dad was very similar in the, the work ethic side. It was constantly working you know, something oftentimes multiple jobs, especially when he wasn't making enough in one job, it was always going to be jumping to another, you know, two, three jobs, whatever it was. And, um, you know, I, I get concerned now. I mean, he's retired and thank God, and he's, you know, enjoying his life right now and golf's like five days a week. And, um, you know, that's, that's about like, he calls me up and he's like, Oh, you won't believe what happened on the course today. You know, like that's, that's his life, which I love to hear. Um, uh, but, uh, um, it doesn't mean I always want to hear it, but I love to hear it. Right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, you know, it, it, as you were saying that the, the, why we sleep thing is it like, so I've, I've sleep apnea. And one of the things I was reading about sleep apnea is that's, uh, that if you have sleep apnea and you're not doing something about it can cause dementia later on in life. And I had no yeah. idea that that was a thing. Right. So, you know, that's one of the things that I, I like, I try to reiterate to folks now, if they're concerned that they have sleep apnea or something like that, or they're not sleeping well, like get tested for it if you like where the CPAP like I wear my CPAP every night like it is phenomenal for me like I it, I wake up more refreshed I you know feel better like everything about it is better and I didn't know that I slept crappy similarly like when I had uh um you know kind of going off some rails here but um I I have um uh, GERD right so I take medication every day I'm day for this acid reflux and until I started taking the medication I didn't know that I felt like crap Right. I just took the medication and then it would like slowly went away and then I'd forget the medication and feel it again and be like, oh, this is that feel I used to have every day. I did. How do I live like this? This is ridiculous. Right. But okay. it goes back to taking care of your health and making sure that, you know, you're 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 like, I mean, I tell people all the time, like I struggle sometimes with I'm, I've had a few different surgeries. I've got bulging discs. I've got some issues that, that are going on. And it's like 
I struggle sometimes playing with my kids, but I really want to be able to play with my grandkids. So what am I going to do now in my life to be able to prepare myself better to be able to play with my grandkids more? Um, and I think that that's what you're talking about with sleep is something that I, I struggle with and I need to work on more. But, um, you know, that's, that's one of those things that we definitely have to take care of our health to be able to push that. Um, so I want, uh, that, that said, I want to transition a little bit into the kid side of the house and kind of understand. Um, I mean, you've got two boys. You said one's a freshman and one's, um, one's a junior high. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about what it's what it's like having those two boys, right? My boys are nine and five, and my little girl is um, almost nine months old. Um, so we're still, you know, fresh on the the girl side of the house. But um, you know, talk to me a little bit about what what it's been like running businesses with um, with kids. Like, uh, you know, do you integrate them at all in the business? What do they know about your businesses? You know, th- tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, having kids, it's it's phenomenal. I mean, just You, you don't know love until you have kids, I feel like, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and I respect people that decide not to have kids, but man, um, it just, you know, you think you love your spouse and then you have kids and you, you see those little eyes look at you and just, you know, there, there's just, it, it's, it's, it's spiritual. It's, it's, you know, emotional, it's everything all in one. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things I've enjoyed most about being a parent is just watching them grow and develop personalities and, you know, and, and see the traits, like what, you know, what, what traits do they have that they get from dad? What traits do they have that they get from mom or what mm-hmm. do they share? And, and uh, so, yeah, they're everything. And, and like I said uh, earlier, I think, you know, one of the things that um, I'll forever owe gratitude to my wife for is just forcing me to be there and, and watch them and be home every night with them and yeah. tuck them in and, and be with them. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, being a, you know, business owner and, and being an entrepreneur and kind of the, the convoluted path to becoming an entrepreneur, if you will, um, it's been challenging. Like there's been, there's been times when, you know, um, one or the other has been sacrificed a little bit, right? Like, you know, if, if it was, I had to take a business trip, you know, I've been really good about not doing those, but, but it happens. And, and you just mm-hmm. wonder what you're missing, you know, like what, you know, yeah. I, I was lucky. I never missed anything that I think was, you know, substantial, right? Um, probably the worst thing I ever missed, the, probably the, made my wife most upset was we missed the, um, my, my younger kid is just incredibly intelligent. Just, I, I, he's, I credit my wife for that too, because he didn't get it from me. Like just, he's, he's a sixth grade. I'm going to brag about my kid a little bit. He's in sixth grade and he's in uh, freshman advanced math. So he's triple advanced math. Nice. And he's acing it. Like just like he's getting a hundred percent on all the exams and everything. Like just it's, it's it's amazing to watch him. And um, you know the one thing that I did, I I missed like the meeting with the teachers to to um uh you know for him get placed in a triple advanced math. And it's like and and I to me it was just a meeting. Like it was a meeting with a teacher. Like I I'm yeah. sorry I was I I was gonna be there. I was just a couple minutes late. Like no big deal. And it it really hurt my wife, like, and maybe she'll be mad at me for telling the story, but, um, I didn't, I, I did, I took it for granted, right? I didn't realize, yeah. um, how, and I was probably, you know, maybe I could have cut the owner off that I was at the owner meeting. I could have cut him off 10 minutes sooner or something and made it perfectly fine. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you just, you don't, you don't think about the ramifications sometimes when you're, when you're doing it, it's, and the entrepreneur life especially can really suck you into that stuff because for sure you're not a nine to five employee, right? So it's not like, oh, I get paid either way. Like, screw this. I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, It's if this doesn't get done, if I don't make this client happy, if I don't, you know, shake his hand, like I may not get the next deal from him or he may be upset and not recommend me for the next job or whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter. And um, I I think I I struggle with this, but one of the tips that somebody, you know, told me, it, it seems obvious and easy to do is you just be honest with people. Be like, I have a meeting for my kids. I have to go. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This is really important. I hope you understand. And I'll be glad to call you as soon as the meeting's over, right? And as as easy it is for me to say that, it's really hard to do. It's hard. It's just a hard habit to form. Um, So, so yeah. So, it's not without struggles, right? And um, I, I hope the kids have not 
felt that. I mean, I was blessed enough, even though I wasn't a hockey player growing up, I, I managed to skate just well enough to get on the ice and pretend I know what I'm doing and, and, and help coach him for a while. And I really got into that and uh, learned even more about the game of hockey and really uh, devoted to being there for them and, and helping coach them. And I was blessed enough to have a, another head coach that, that brought me in to, to spend time uh, on the bench and in the locker room with my kids. And mm-hmm. that was just, I, I mean, I can't even describe that experience. Like that was just phenomenal. I loved every second of it. I'll never, I'll never regret whatever business may have suffered to be there for every every one of those games and practices and the weekends and and just the time on the ice with them and the bonding time and that was yeah that was really cool. Um, so those those types of things have really become important and so you know this this Christmas I went out and and I just bought a bunch of board games because we recently been having like some board game nights and nice. and I was just thinking like hey we you know it's just. Like sometimes it feels, it feels cumbersome, right? It's like, ah, oh, you know, I gotta get so much to do, or I need to sleep, or whatever, and I gotta mm-hmm. go, you know. But at the end of the day, though, those little things that you do are what the kids are gonna remember more yeah. than it, like the laughs you have at you know taking the time to play Monopoly with them or or learn a new board game. Or we had this <laughs> crazy, I forget what it's called, something something unicorns, something like that. And it was the most complicated, like convoluted game ever, but I bought it. So mm-hmm. I'm like, we're going to play it. We're going to learn the rules and we're going to get through this game. And my wife and both my kids were like, what can we just quit and play something <laughs> else? I'm like, no, we're going to finish what we started because we started it. And, uh, and yeah, I was, it, I, I hope we play it again. Cause I actually thought it was kind of funny, but, That's um, funny. you know, so, so really just finding those little things where I can connect with them and, and, so yeah, I went out and just bought like, you know, they, they get a couple every year and we have a whole, you know, cabinet full of them, but I went out and bought like six more. I'm like, let's just, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, have family board game nights or times, mm-hmm. right? Maybe or after practices, come home for early from school and, and just try to make that something that we connect with them. Cause it's, especially when you get, you know, they get to the age where, um, you give them phones or iPads or, you know, technology and it, man, it, we get addicted to it. and. And I'm like, that's the one, if there's one thing that I, you know, I've been thinking about what I'm putting on my, my one sheet for next year. And, and one of the things I'm like, family time needs to be family time. Meaning just because I'm there doesn't mean I'm there. If I'm there, but I'm yeah. constantly looking at my phone because of a text message or an email or whatever. When you said I'm you're a Catholic there. guy, it sounds like a great thing for Lent, giving up the phone <laughs> at home, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Ouch. Um, Start yeah, a painful thanks, one, right? Yeah, now I got to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think so. That's that's a big one. Is just you know be be present. Um, yeah. And and you know Simon Sinek had a talk one time where he does it, and and he's talking to everybody, and then he grabs a phone and he's just talking, and the phone's in the picture, and he's like, "Are you distracted now? I'm not. It's not beeping. I'm not talking on it. I'm not even looking at it. But just me holding this makes you feel less connected than if I'm talking to you and I have nothing in my hands." And, you know, I, I, once you hear something like that, then you feel it when you're talking to other people or you're, you're around, mm-hmm. you know, somebody. So, so that, that's one of the things that I want to work on improving personally. And, you know, anybody that's listening, like that's a, that's a big tip is like, you know, it's tough. It's really hard to do, but there's nothing more important than, than that time you get with your kids. Cause you know, 18 summers, right? Whatever, whatever, For however sure. you want to look at it. It's all you get. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just recently decided that um, so we're we're going to the Go Abundance event up in Vermont. Um, that will already be done and gone by the time this episode comes out. But we're headed up there and we're doing the fan abundance beforehand. So I'm bringing the family. We're going to go up there and have a good time. I looked at my wife. I said, you know what? She couldn't get the extra days off of work. But I said, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm just going to drive up with the boys. It's like, let's have an adventure with the boys. We'll stop at a couple different places. We'll make it a fun drive. It'll probably save me, you know, a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred dollars in plane tickets, you know. So I'm just going to make the drive with the boys and have a good time, um, and then I won't have to rent a car when I get up there too. So it was like, I I'm not going to get that back, and they're not going to forget that. You know, we're going to stop at a few different places, enjoy some time together, have some fun in some hotel pools, and you know what the heck? Like it just, I'm trying to find those things to be able to do to bring the kids in and help them understand it. Just recently you know, for their birthdays, they're both December babies. And, um, so this past December, we went on a cruise for their birthday, 
we said, we're not going to get you any presents. You're not getting any presents, but we're going to take you on an adventure. So we went on their very first cruise. We went to Mexico. We had a great time on the cruise. I mean, the cruise was, it's only my third cruise, but it was by far the rockiest. We were back and forth, which was great for the boys, not so great for the parents. Like, we were like, what in the world? Like, my yeah. oldest was like, this is so much fun. This is awesome. Like, I was like, no, it's not. You're like walking down the, walking down the, um, the hallways, bouncing off of each wall. It's like, good oh, gracious. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we were up on like the 12th floor, and the, the 12th deck outside, and they shut it down. Like the security person came out and was like, we're closing it. It's the wind. It's too bad. Like it was oh my ridiculous. Wow. So I've got good videos wow. of them trying to run against it. But anyways, I'm saying all that to say that, you know, you, you talked about going on a lot of adventures with the kids, and I want to get into that a little bit. And to me, that's one of those things that I'm trying to add in there because they're always talking about how much I'm in this office. So if I could find ways to bring them out and show them adventures. You know, my wife and I wrote down all of our 2024 goals for this year and we want to have eight mini adventures with the family. Like like two a quarter, that's not too astronomically crazy, like just mini adventures. It could be in the state of Florida. We don't have to fly anywhere, go anywhere. You, you getting up, buddy? No. For those of you just listening, I've had this little man on my chest the entire time. He woke up from his nap right before we started and he's just loving life hanging out with daddy. Little um, Spider-Man. Yeah, my little Spider-Man. Um but these 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 adventures with the kids, uh, you know, they they need to happen because those are the things they're going to remember. They're not going to care less about any of the toys that I bought them or any of those things. But they're going to remember Daddy coaching on the ice. They're going to remember going on a trip somewhere with you. They're going to remember all of that stuff. Um, but they're also going to remember you holding onto a phone. So that's a uh, that's one of those that I why I still struggle with because I know even on that drive I'm going to have business phone calls. I'm going to when we're going to be stopping. I'm going to have to check some emails. I'm going to have to do some things. And it's like how do I balance those? And I hate the word balance, and I've, I've said that 15 million times on this podcast, and I still say the word balance because it's just part of our culture is to try to talk about that. But I think it's a, uh, you know, I think it's nearly impossible to actually get that balance. So we'll see how it, yeah, how it said, all it's comes out in the wash. It's, yeah. I, I think it's it's not about balance. It's just, you know, if, if there is a balance, it's just thinking about how do you balance, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why, that's why the family boardroom kind of, struck a nerve with me. It's like, man, we spend so much time thinking about setting plans for, you know, targeting. Like I just wrote a vivid yep. vision, like a personal vivid vision this year. Um, it was part of the pod, you know, challenge that we did. And, and that really yep. made you think, like, I, I had never done that before. And that was really eye opening to think about like goal setting for personal goals. Right. And, and where to be and where I see my kids being and, and then, you know, what are their goals? And anyways, yeah, it was, it was really insightful, but you talked about, you know, cruises. That's that actually. So my wife's parents uh, retired. Oh, man, this is it's probably like, I don't remember, 2015, maybe something like that. And um, they wanted to do a, a cruise. So we did a cruise to Alaska, um, oh, which was would love that. amazing. Like, it was so cool. And it was such a good trip. So we went with my wife's parents and um, her two sisters and their kids and just had a blast. Um, so then we decided pretty much every other year or so we've done another cruise. So we've went up, um, man, I'm losing count now, but we went up, uh, on the East coast. So we went up to like Nova Scotia, New England nice. coast and did that side, yep. uh, which that was cool. A lot of great lobster. Um, we yep. did one in, um, the Caribbean just to, to do it. Um, we did, um, one, we, we flew to Hong Kong and then we sailed to Japan and back. Nice. Um, that was really cool. That was probably the only one, like I remember sailing out there and the weather was pretty bad. And then when we, we actually had to, we missed one of our stops because of a typhoon that came in. Um, so that was probably the like roughest. It wasn't nearly as bad as yeah. what you were explaining, but we had some rough <laughs> seas in that one. Um, and a lot of open sea time. And then recently we just went, and I might be missing one in there, but recently the last one we did last summer was we went to um, the Mediterranean. So we flew to, nice. to Rome, stayed in Rome for a few days, and then we went to uh, two stops in Greece. We went Mykonos and Santorini, and then we went to oh, uh, Kusadasi, Turkey, and back. And then we hit Naples as well. Um, we're actually so almost that exact same path we're looking at doing this fall. Um, it's amazing. So my brother-in-law and sister-in-law do. We're setting it up, and they're like, "Hey, you guys are more than welcome to come if you want." That's almost that exact same path: hitting uh, Italy, Greece, Turkey, um, and something else. So, yeah. mm. oh man, Santorini was like unbelievably gorgeous. Like it was, it was phenomenal. So That's awesome. there's a there's a um, I forget the website cruise book my cruise or something like. There's a cruise uh, 
there's this website devoted to telling you which cruises or how many cruises are going to be in the port each day. So like you can actually look as you're booking, if you have some flexibility in what you're booking, mm -hmm. you can book, you can look and say, okay, I want to be in Santorini when there's less than three cruise ships because it can get yeah. really crowded with five yeah. cruise ships, like two hour wait for the trolley up and down or the cable lift. So you can actually look at these websites and see like, where do you want to, like, where's the optimal time, you know, which one to book um, for the least number of ships in port at the different ports. You can that only control, sense. you know, one or two, but Santorini is definitely one. Like if that, if there's like, I think there was two or three cruise ships when we were there and it was busy. I mean, like, man, if there was five, like, Oh my God, like, it would, yeah. it would have been much less enjoyable. Um, so just a little traveler's tip from our, our, our recent experiences, but uh, yeah, I, I love, like it. The cruises are great. Like that's so much time we spend and, and it, you're always together on those things, right? Like you're mm -hmm. doing all the things together. The cousins are doing things together. Like we've done a couple of cruises where they had, uh, ice rinks on the ship. So we'd bring all of our skates and do the, like, oh, the open nice. skate. Um, yeah. so that was always a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it's like, those are, you know, some people, you know, don't like the cruises. They kind of poo-poo on them because they're like, oh, I won't be on a ship. And I'm like, man, I'm the guy that drives and has to carry all the luggage. So for me, if we took a trip to like Oregon or something, A, you know, my wife, she's, she really likes things clean and new. Like she doesn't like to stay in like the old, you know, old school Airbnbs or old hotels or things like that. And, and you know, camping is probably out of the question unless it's like glamping baby. <laughs> Um, so like, we're not those, like, like we travel and do things. We're okay outdoors, but we're not the like wilderness type people. So for her, like those types of trips, um, it would be a lot of, you know, I'd be driving the whole time. I'd be going, mm -hmm. you know, carrying the bags into a hotel, out of the hotel, like, and yeah, you get to immerse yourself a little more locally, but a cruise is great. Cause you, you get off, you get back on, like yep. your bed's made, like dinner's ready. Like. You they put up, the luggage on the ship for you. They take the luggage off the ship for you. It's yes. That's so yeah. nice. So yeah, I mean, we've, we've done a ton of that. It, that's, that's yeah. It, it, of all the things we've done, like we've traveled a ton. Like I, so a really cool thing that we're doing, this was, I think, I think this was my wife's idea. Um, I don't know if she stole from somebody probably, but she, um, she has a, a map um, of the United States and mm -hmm. then every state, that we've been to as a family, we have a family photo from. So we have photos on this map of nice. us as a family in every state that we've been to. And I think we only have 21 states left or something like that. Nice. Um, and awesome. we're hitting three or four of them on spring break. So that's kind of become our like spring break and or summer is we're trying to plan trips around hitting all 50 states as a family before they, before, my oldest leave. So that'd be, so we only have Love like it. four years left to, to do, you know, we basically need to hit like five States a year. So yeah. it's going to be a challenge, but um, that was pretty cool. Like, it, cause it takes you places. Like we went to, you know, different state capitals that you'd never go to, you know, in some States we'll cheat, like we'll just cross the bridge and take a picture mm -hmm. in that state. And walk back, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but, uh, uh, but it's a, that's a cool, like, you know, just a, it's an idea, something to give you a challenge to do something sure. different. And, um, yeah. and travel just as a family. Cause it, the other thing I found like a lot of our travel that we were doing, like spring breaks, you know, we'd go to Mexico or whatever we were going like, cause that's where some of the other families were going. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, it was good, but, uh, it, it, you know, you can always do those trips, right. Versus the trips as a family where you're going somewhere unique, like we yeah. toured, you know, uh, Kansas city, we went and toured the football stadium and, you know, we ch checked out like, um, I forget what, where we were, but like the state capital, and you saw this really cool library that had, you know, it was built in the 1800s. It's got a glass floor in the upper deck of the library, That's just cool. like. And I'm I'm a weird like not a history buff, but I I like I like to read all those little signs and crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids are all like, "Let's go, let's go!" But so <laughs> enjoy enjoy it where you can. Yeah. Yeah, I love taking the, the kids traveling somewhere. Like to me, it's always, you know, that's one of the things I think you put in your, even in the, the pre-call sheet was like traveling is one of the things you guys love to do. And it, to me, um, you get so much out of the travels. It's it's not just 
the time, right? You get the, they get to experience things well beyond anything, you know, I'm going to, it's going to be kind of a weird thing, but I did a lot of traveling when I was younger. I was a military brat and then went into the military right afterwards. So I traveled all over the place. I went to college and I've got all these kids who had never even left the county they were born in, but they have all these opinions and they don't know why they have these opinions. They were just taught to them that this is what they should have. But like the U S was his sixth country he'd been to. What, like he was born in Japan and then we bounced around other countries and the U S was his sixth country he'd been to. He hadn't even been to the States yet. He's a, you know, obviously an American citizen, but comes to the States, his sixth country. Like that's experience that like, you're not going to get like you're, you can read all the books you want, but unless you're going out and experiencing these things, like you don't really know what life is like other places. And um, to me, I love being able to do that and help them experience that. And um, I will say that is one thing I, that is, is hard about, um, uh, cruises is you don't really get to experience the country you know you get to experience where the tourists drop where the tourists are right yeah. uh, my wife yeah. and i we went on a cruise together once we went to i think it was cozumel or something we'd stop there and then we just jumped off and rented a, a moped the two of us just rode nice. around on a moped just all over the place just check it all out get away from all the tourists get away from all the tour like uh, stop again at a restaurant somewhere out in the middle of nowhere thankfully she speaks spanish so that helps us out but, um oh somebody's at the front door steve yeah, sorry. Man, oh man. <laughs> no kids. You get people coming up. I got a little uh, Alexa here at my office, so it lets me see my ring nice. doorbell when somebody comes home. It's always fun. I my like my youngest likes to put on a show. He always comes home and uh-huh. he'll like dance in front of it or whatever. You know? So <laughs> kinda, it's the kind of That's personality awesome. he is. He's always having fun. I love it. Yeah, That's I, good I stuff. like that, that. To your point, like that, you know, the, the cultural experiences uh, are challenging. One of the things, so my wife's family. Uh, my wife's 100% Chinese, but she was born and raised here in the States um, near Chicago land. Um, yeah, South uh-huh, side. Of course, and, Chicago uh, land, of course. Um, so she she grew up um, here, but her parents, one grew up in China, the other one in Hong Kong. Uh, they actually, I think they met when they came to the state side. Um, but we went back and visited there, uh, I think once before kids and I think twice after we've had kids, maybe three times. I, I lose count of these things. That's how much we travel. <laughs> I can't even remember the number of times. But, but I was that kid. Like I did not board an airplane until it was for athletics for us to fly to football games. Like we flew mm-hmm. to, I think the Rose Bowl or something I got to fly out to. And that was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane in my entire life. Wow. So, you know, I was that kid that, I mean, the, the, because my parents worked so hard and because, yeah, we, we were by no means poor, right? But we have, mm-hmm. absolutely were not the top 1%, right? Like a lot of us, you know, tend to be. Um, and and because of that, we didn't, you know, get like our traveling was like we traveled to see our cousins or whatever. And yeah. so we had a couple of epic trips. And, and one of them was like we went to Jekyll Island, Georgia and drove down there. And, you know. I love uh, Jekyll Island. You, you really yeah. remember that trip, right? I, I remember everything about that trip. Like I remember going to Okefenokee swamp mm-hmm. and, and getting rained on and my mom like <laughs> carrying the thing on her head, like really distinctive memories. And I have a ton of memories with my kids, but man, I, they're all over the place. Like I can't remember yeah. what place we did what, but um, yeah, J- Japan's, a, I, that was, you know, the stop there was different. We actually, I was lucky enough um, as part of a graduate program yeah. Um, in college, we went to Japan and uh, stayed there for, I think, a week or something and toured different construction companies. So we spent nice. quite a bit of time over there. And, and you're right. The experience, like when I've been to Hong Kong, when that trip to Japan versus the cruise stop in Japan, like you really, yeah. you, you're right. That's the one thing you miss is you don't get that immersion. You know, like when I traveled to Hong Kong, like I almost started learning some of the language, right? Even yeah. better. Um, because you're there and you're immersed in it versus, you know, if you're stopping there on a cruise ship, like, yeah, you don't, you don't have that immersion mm-hmm. and, and, you know, absorption as, as you would. But, um, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's so important. And, and I do think, I mean, I worry, I worry a little bit because I have drive because I, I didn't have a lot. And I recognize mm-hmm. that at some point that I didn't have a lot. And I think that's good. Like there's healthy and unhealthy parts of that. Like the healthy part is I have a drive and I want to succeed and I want to work yeah. hard and I want to do the best. And, and I had good went- mentors along the way, but I do worry that my kids are like totally spoiled. Like yeah. they've had all this travel. 
they, they have no one. Like we, it's like at Christmas, like you said, it's like, what do you give them for gifts? Like kind of have everything. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. like one of the gifts we got him was a second Xbox so they could each play at the <laughs> same time. Like, like there's kids out there that would die to have one of them. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, my least, kids. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so like, it's, it's tough sometimes to, uh, to try to keep them, to think about how to keep them grounded. And, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think they're good kids. I, everybody else tells me they're good kids, and they just seem to fight all the good. time. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they are boys, and that's what's going to happen. My boys tend to do that all the time, but, that, man, they love each other, and they're great kids. And um, and I'm not just saying that because you're sitting on my lap, buddy. But, um, <laughs> but they're, I mean, they, um, I, I, I'm, I've talked to a few people about how do we, quote, unquote, manufacture struggle, right? How do we manufacture something that for them to, to have to work at? And, um, you know, there's a few different things that people have talked about, but it's, it's one of those that we have to find what works for our kids to be able to help them struggle. Sometimes it's sometimes it is sports like you have to do a lot in sports that are, are going to make make you struggle. Um, yeah. You know, maybe maybe they're not entrepreneurial minded, but, you know, uh, making them do something along those lines that that stretches their brain a little bit that makes them think and see the other way around. And, you know, I. I you know, what's funny is I never hear, um, I, I didn't think about this till now, because one of our goals right now that my wife and I just created for 2024 was to take the whole family out on like some sort of a give back trip, like whether it's a, um, you know, soup kitchen or something like that, where we're giving back to the community in one way, shape or form to help them kind of see the other side. And, you know, that that is yet to be really one. And I, I don't really know why, I'm, as I'm saying it out loud. Um, nobody's really ever talked about it in that in that sense, like, hey, help them see the struggles of other people to help them kind of understand what they have. Um, uh, Boy, that's interesting. I'm, I don't know why I'm just pondering pondering through that. So, um, yeah, I'm not did, really trying you know, to take it anywhere. Like, but. Um, we had a yeah. we had Catholic heart work camps when I was growing up, and yeah. we mm-hmm. did um, why can't we did a few mission thing? trips for um, rebuilding yes. together. Yes. Wrong watch. So we would yeah. uh, go I down and you know basically out. renovate somebody's house or or do whatever and give all the labor for it. Those were great yeah. trips, and I you know yeah. I, I like they were fun to me as a kid, but it did yeah. really open up. I mean, I remember, you know, going under and installing a toilet. And I, I mean, dude, I mean, I was like crawling underneath a mobile home, like who knows what I was laying in, like uh-huh. helping reconnect the plumbing on some toilets and stuff. And like, you know, so it, it kind of forced some, some odd situation in me. I would just, I, I'm a do it, right? I was going to go do it. Nobody else would get under yep. there and do it. I'm like, I'll do it. Um, yep. and luckily there was no like rattlesnakes or anything under there or whatever it would have been <laughs> Louisiana or wherever we were when we were doing it. But, uh, yeah, those are good things. You know, uh, there's a good one. If you're just looking for like an easy day trip, um, we did a, a thing for my, my youngest son's team. Uh, the manager's, he's a great guy. He, uh, wanted to do something this year. So he put together a feed my starving children trip. So okay. they all went and that one's kind of neat. Like you go in and, and they explain who you're helping and, and the impact you make. And then everybody wash their hands, put the caps on and you actually have different t- uh, tasks of like putting the, you know, the grains and the, you know, the rice and everything into these packets that they seal up. And then those nice. are meal packets that they, they send to, you know, whatever, you know, different countries. So that was a good one. That one's, you That's know, really cool. pretty it's pretty light. You just need a day, you know, or four hours to yep. do it. That one was pretty easy to, 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 uh, fit in somewhere, but yeah, I've, you know, that's an interesting concept, the manufacturer struggle. Um, yeah. Um, you know, cause it's, it's one thing to see struggle, right. And that's, you know, that, that was one thing that I, I mean, uh, if anything in my life, I've seen a lot of struggle, um, um, around my travels through, throughout the world, but, uh, you know, and I, I don't necessarily want to, I don't really know what I want to do yet to, to really kind of manufacture some of that because some of it they're just going to get through normal life. Um, but some of it, I'd really like them to know what it's like to, to work really hard for something, you know? Um, and you know, when, when they're getting, you know, their to, to use your example, their second Xbox, um, that they didn't really, you know, quote unquote work hard for. I mean, I don't know what they did or didn't do. Don't, don't take me wrong, but that's not really yeah. like, okay. Like you don't know really what it takes to do this, which is why, I mean, I, I have conversations with them about the things that I'm buying them. Okay. Okay. Well, look, if I put money in that, then I can't put money over here or, you know, I'm having to earn money by doing this to be able to do these things. And so it's all about, you know, trying to teach them some of these things, but man, um, some of the struggles that I had, I mean, I was very paycheck to paycheck for a long time. Um, and that's, 
difficult to work through. And then to go from that to, you know, helping run businesses, like that's a, it's a whole different world. So how do I, how do I give them the ability to run businesses without having to have the heartache that I used to have? You know what I mean? And I don't fully know what that means yet, but of course, you know, as, as anybody who's watching the video, so I was uh, my kid's five, so I've got some time to figure this out, right? Uh, the middle guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the oldest, I mean, he's nine. There's, there's, there's only, you know, there's only so much time you really do have. It kind of runs away from you pretty quickly. So, yeah, I mean, I've looked at like, you know, having the kids work in the business and um, I've mm-hmm. thought a lot about that. My wife and I talked about it. like the older son, like this, this coming summer, you know, he talked about working in the business and, and you know, just being a laborer on job sites. And yep. I think it's a good idea. The wife made a really good point though. And, and she's like, you know, that sounds good, but it kind of still reinforces like she's working for his dad. Right. So, you know, you're probably going to be unfortunately more lenient or if you are strict on him, like if he overslept and you yell at him or dock his pay or whatever, then you're just being that, you know, butthole of a dad, right? Not, yeah. not a boss, not right? A boss. Yeah. So, so I thought about that a little bit and, and, um, you know, I think she made some good points and I, I know some guy, I mean, there's plenty I mean, my, my partner's son works and, you know, is hard worker and, and, you know, it's on the job sites and stuff. So I think I, I see that as an opportunity, but I kind of understand where she's coming from. And, um, so then it's okay. Maybe I get him a job working for, you know, one of the other, you know, subs or trade partners that I know yeah. that, you know, could use a, a summer labor or, or do we get him in something else? I mean, he does, he, he volunteered for a while at the senior care center, um, near us and seemed to enjoy that. And, um, uh, so I think he enjoyed it. And that was a nice, like volunteer and, and, um, you know, he, he for whatever reason gravitated, he, he didn't mind like going and talking to old people and spending time with them. And, mm-hmm. um, maybe it's cause it's easy. I don't know, <laughs> but, but it, he seemed to like that. So maybe we'll find something like that. My younger son is, um, he, he's the one that he, he asks more questions about my business. Like we talked about, uh, so, so the, the real estate deal we did is we, we bought an old, uh, gas station, tore it down, uh, rezoned it, permitted it. And we're building, um, uh, a five townhouse, uh, single unit, five townhouse development. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's the one that I don't have to tell him. He just naturally, how much does it cost you to build that? What are you going to sell them for? How much money does that make mean you make? Nice. And he's like, well, do you really make that money or, or do you have to, you know, give that to your partner? Right. So then mm-hmm. I explained to him like how we, you know, we raised a little friends and family syndicate. So we went in for 10%, they have 90%, but then we split the profits and, and gave him the number. And because he's like Johnny on the spot with the numbers, like I'm like, so let's yeah. say we make 350,000 and they get 60 and I get 40. And then what's the return on investment? And he's immediately like, you can see his brain churning. He's like, Oh, you get, mm-hmm. you get two X and they get 1.3 X. And yeah. I'm like, so there's, I can see him like, you know, gravitating towards, you know, a numbers type job. So, so nice. then the same thing. It's like, man, I can't wait until he's old enough. Like I'm going to have him come under right deals for me. Like he's probably going to yeah. do a better job yeah. than I do. Um, so I don't know if I'll run in the same, uh, same, uh, you know, restraints of, Hey, he needs to go work for somebody else. But, um, you know, I've talked to some guys that um, there's a lot of guys in the trades that end up taking over businesses, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they work for their dads. And, and I, I see some like there's a drywall guy that I know that, that uh, we use and he's awesome. And I walk on the job site and his kid's there and he's pointing stuff. He's like, what's that? You know, it's it's in it's a rough end stage. So it's like fra- wood framed house yep. and they're, they're the pipes and stuff and the conduits are in the walls. But, you, you know, you can't really tell what anything is unless you know. Yeah. And he's pointing mm-hmm. to this stuff. And he's like, "Oh, that's a sink, Dad. That's a toilet. That's where a light's gonna go. That's where the shower is." Like he just, you know, he's been on enough sites, and his and yeah. his, his kids absorbed it. Then, I mean, his kid was like you know, probably eight, nine years old, and was like yeah. Johnny on the spot awesome. and stuff. So I was like, "I'm not doing a good job." <laughs> I <Like>, guess, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it, it, I do struggle a little bit with like, you know, we 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 work so hard, and part of this. I think everybody, like we said earlier, is like, is it for the money? And, and part of it's, yeah, I want to have that legacy wealth, right? I want to be able to to give back, right? And, and make an impact, mm-hmm. you know, philanthropy. And, and and then also, you know, have a trust set up for the kids. And I want them to be able, like, if, if my older one wants to, you know, you know, go and, and try to play hockey for the rest of his life, great. I don't want him to have to yeah. worry that he can't do that because yeah. financially he can't afford to. Or if my younger one wants yeah. to be a mathematician 
professor. Like, I don't know, it probably doesn't pay that great. So maybe that's what he wants to do. Um, you know, if he wants to what you're doing as a mathematician, yeah. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So, yeah, it's a that's a big struggle. Um, making the noise. Uh-oh. You're making some noises with your ice? Yeah. Hmm? It's, it's, oh, yeah? Yeah, it's not making the noise. It's not making the pops? No. You put ice in and it didn't make pops? Oh, man, oh, man. Go get another ice cube. See if that one does it. Use hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Use hot water, yeah. Uh, That'll make it pop. Um, but, so, yeah, it's uh, I, 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 that's one that I'm... You know, maybe need to think about and work on is like what what do I see the future and and I, I don't know. I mean, everything's still sort of new, right? I, I don't have that much real estate. You know, we're just doing the single mm-hmm. development right now, and we've got you know big plans to buy more and invest more. But um, so maybe there'll be something that comes out of that with the kids. But I, I've talked to a lot of the guys back to that point in the trades that they now took over their their you know father or grandfather's business, but yeah. a lot of them that seemed the most successful didn't directly do it. They weren't yeah. handed the business. They went and worked for somebody else. They had a job as a banker. They got a job mm-hmm. as whatever. And then they came back and took over the business because their dad got a retirement age or, or yeah. they saw an opportunity to grow the business. And for whatever reason, those guys seem to be the ones that do better. And, and I, so I think there's something to like going and, and, you know, getting a little bit in that corporate world and, working a nine to five and you know, if that makes you maybe think a little bit more about, uh, man, I'm going to work a little harder as an entrepreneur. So I don't have to go back yeah. to that. I, I, yeah. I do think there's something to that, you know, so potentially. I think there's, what's the saying that, um, entrepreneurs are the only ones who give up a 40 hour, uh, a week job for good pay to, to take an 80 hour a week job for crappy pay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's basically what we do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. well, on that note, he just got an ice cube. It's popping all over the place, but, uh, we didn't touch a bunch of the things I was, I was, uh, wanting to jump down, but we had some great conversations. I really appreciate you jumping on Steve. Is there anything that we, that you we wanted to mention, um, that you really wanted to touch on before the call that we, uh, that we haven't actually, uh, uh, touched on? No, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think we, we nailed just about everything. I mean, I can't think of awesome. too many things, uh, we didn't touch on here. And, uh, again, I really appreciate the, the time and conversation. I mean, you know, it's funny, it's very different backgrounds. Um, you know, yeah. you being in the military, which by the way, thank you for your service. I always appreciate that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. And, um, you know, where you end up in life and, uh, you know, but that, that drive, that, that visionary uh, entrepreneurial spirit is just something that drives everybody. And yeah, I guess if there's anything that I hope that my kids get, I hope they get that from me, right? That, that drive yeah. and that vision. And, you know, if, if, if nothing else fails, like whether they become a successful entrepreneur or not, if at least they, they get that drive to be a good employee or, or be a mm-hmm. hard worker at the end of the day, that's to me, what matters more than anything is they're a good person. They're honest and, you know, they learn the value of hard work and, Maybe they're smart enough to then go read Who Not How and and you know <laughs> do do it better than we did, right? Yeah, yeah. Good strong work ethic will take you a long ways, no matter which direction you take. Whether you're going to be an employee, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur um, working directly for an entrepreneur, whatever it is, good strong work ethic is going to be something that'll bring you through. So, um, but no, I I really appreciate your time, Steve. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, I thank you so much. Um, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, maybe they want to uh, learn more about your um, your businesses or more about you as a as a father. How do they? What's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Sure. Yeah. So um, you can always find me on the business side. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can just search my name, Steve Bluntlinger, uh, on LinkedIn. All my social handles are all S Bluntlinger. So S, my really hard to spell last name, uh, S B L E N T L I N G E R. So I can go go faster than most people can spell it. Um, so I'll give those links to you. They can find me there. Um, on our awesome. on our business side, probably the best spots are our website for uh, for Redwood. Uh, so that's Redwood Built. So Redwood like the tree and Built, B-U-I-L-T, as in Tom.com. And then uh, we're the same Redwood Built on all the social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, etc. So we awesome. um, we have a little bit of a social media presence. That's one of the things that uh, that we may try to grow next year. But yeah, I'd love to there hear anybody go. that uh, if there's something I said that you want more information on, feel free to, to reach out. My email is just steve at redwoodbuilt.com, real easy. So i uh, be happy to uh, schedule a call with anybody or emails or whatever, whatever works for anybody. I'm, I think, uh, you know, there's 
I was listening to this uh, graduation quote the other day, or, or uh, you know, speech, and and the guy said one of his tips was always be a teacher, and even if you're not a teacher, be teaching, right? So mm -hmm. um, I really got something out of that. I thought that was important. So yeah, always like to be yeah. learning, but always like to be teaching and passing on knowledge that I've learned as well. I love it. That's awesome. Well, uh, again, everybody reach out to Steve. All of his contact stuff will be in the show notes. Um, please like, subscribe, listen to this, I don't know, 50,000 times, as many times as you can, so we can uh, get the downloads up and running. But uh, thank you again, Steve, for jumping on. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we will see everybody on the next show. Thanks, Adam. Have a good one.